This is The Curious Gamer, a show about the culture, design, and joy of games. I'm Devin Pulaski. This is part two of the episode, A Case of Sonic Mania. You don't have to listen to the first part, but it may be helpful for context. All right, so just dropped off my friend Mike. We saw the Sonic movie, and as a quick little review, I liked it. So last time, I discussed how I first encountered and fell in love with video games when I was four years old, and it was Sonic the Hedgehog that ushered me into this wide and wonderful world. I've gone on to enjoy many other game franchises, but Sonic has been with me the longest, and as such, I can trace many great memories from my life to this blue hedgehog. Each of these memories revolves around three gifts, a love of technology, a career in creativity, and close relationships. Today, I'd like to discuss a time when Sonic was a catalyst that enabled these three things. To start, let's talk about technology. When I was in the second grade, my dad surprised me with our family's first personal computer a Hewlett Packard desktop with Windows 95. It's easy to forget that during the 90s, the desktop computer wasn't a ubiquitous household item yet. Just like with home gaming consoles, it was a burgeoning technology starting to hit the mainstream. My natural inclination was to use the computer to play games, especially the kind of games you couldn't find on something like the Sega Genesis. I played classic titles like Oregon Trail 2, yeah! The Magic School Bus, what? and Age of Empires. The more games I played, the more accustomed I got to computers, like navigating file systems, installing software, and having a general familiarity with the operating system. Years would pass, and I would wring out as much utility and secrets as I could from that old Hewlett Packard PC. It made me appreciate technology of all kinds, and my fascination wandered from one gadget to the next. I quickly became one of those kids in school that was comfortable helping out the teacher with technology, setting up projectors and TVs, and fixing minor computer issues that would naturally crop up. And this love of technology served me well in college, where I was always able to stay at the top of my class thanks to harnessing the best tools of my craft. It's easy to reduce people with these tendencies as just tech nerds, which is, well, true. But it's not as simple as knowing what the coolest gadgets are. Think of technology as like learning how to read. It requires a certain type of literacy, which develops over time the more technology you use. Whether you like it or not, being tech literate is an obvious and important skill needed to be an active member in today's society. The greater your tech literacy, the more opportunities it affords you in life. It's knowing how to use tech to save you time and energy. It's utilizing which tools will help you do your work and it's demonstrating how to harness technology to be a better job candidate than the next person. More tech literacy doesn't necessarily mean better, but in many cases, it certainly doesn't hurt. Unfortunately, many people hit a wall, and their tech literacy only goes so far. It often comes when we encounter something about a piece of hardware or software that feels too foreign, complex, or just scary in some way. And it can start at a very young age. In the year 2020, this problem is made ever more complicated to the point where it might seem like a better idea to retreat from technology altogether than it is to embrace it. This is especially true when you start to consider all the ways technology is putting our privacy and personal information at risk, or how we mindlessly expend our attention on our gadgets, among many other dangers. I'm glad to have grown up in an era where technology was still a bit primitive compared to today, but was nonetheless inspiring and accessible, where I could get lost running around as a blue hedgehog in a magical digital world and be inspired to seek out what other joys could be found on other machines. I was able to use technology to get ahead in school, to stand out in my college program, and go on to obtain a fulfilling career at a technology company. Games are a wonderful gateway to tech literacy. Rather than discourage experimentation and failure, games explicitly encourage it, allowing you to familiarize yourself with different technology and digital systems. 
games require your full attention and engagement in order to make progress, meaning you must build your competency and demonstrate your mastery over time. And because games are, well, games, the stakes are lower than, say, finding a job or paying rent. Failure in a game doesn't cause you any permanent harm outside the game itself. But as important as tech literacy is, it's only one of the benefits afforded by a life spent playing video games. This takes me to the second gift of gaming I'd like to discuss. Creativity. Creativity and play make great companions. The more you play a game, the more you're an active participant in another world and dynamic system, where every action you make has consequences and ripple effects. When you set down the controller or a keyboard and mouse, it's common to have a hunger for these feelings of agency to endure. And this hunger is fed by creativity. I remember the precise moment where I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life pursuing a creative career. And video games were at the center of it. When I was in the seventh grade, I was obsessed with the game Sonic Adventure 2 on my Sega Dreamcast. The melodramatic story, stylistic gameplay, and the edgy new character, Shadow the Hedgehog, coalesced into a perfect, beautiful mess for my middle schooler brain. I mean, imagine being in middle school and hearing how music in your favorite game went from charming and wholesome 16-bit tunes like this. To sounding like this. No matter the genre or instrumentation, energetic music is core to the Sonic series. I always think of the game's music almost like a food or drink that you consume, giving you the energy to move fast. The older I got, and the more music I began to discover outside of games, the more I yearned to combine the worlds, to infuse other music I liked into Sonic games. Now, around this time, I had started playing around with different audio and video cables. I discovered I could hook up my portable CD player to my family's VCR player, and then record music onto blank videotapes. I mean, I can't tell you why I wanted to do this. I mean, this is the kind of weird experiment that would not be fun today, since you can easily manipulate sound and video with hundreds of free apps on a smartphone. But this was the early 2000s. And luckily, doing this silly experiment led to a light bulb going off in my head that would change my life. Here's what happened. So, in video games, there are moments called cutscenes, which are basically little movies that play to flesh out a game's story. Sonic Adventure 2 has tons of these, and yes, they're usually super cheesy, in the best way. You never cease to surprise me, Blue Hedgehog. I thought that capsule you were in exploded in space. You know, what can I say? I die hard. I started capturing my favorite segments of these cutscenes onto a VHS tape. I would cut out a few seconds here and there of moments where Sonic and Shadow were doing something cool, and edit them together using two VCRs. Once I had a sequence I was happy with, I would play it back with a new song I had chosen using my CD player. And to a middle school boy in the early 2000s, the most obvious musical pairing for Sonic was something from The Matrix. Imagine hearing this song while images of Sonic and his friends racing and battling plays on screen. When I finished my edit and hit play, it was an intense high that I couldn't get enough of. Seeing how the confluence of technology and creativity came together to remix something I love into an original work that I made was utterly satisfying. My thirst for movie making didn't stop there. I went on to shoot short films and skits with my friends. I even came up with a technique for putting sound effects into my movies using my GameCube. So I was shooting a clearly very serious war movie called Deadly Deception, and I needed some gun sound effects. So on my GameCube, I loaded up a game called James Bond Agent Under Fire. I created an empty room with whatever weapons I needed. 
Then I would go into the game's settings and turn the music off. This meant that I could play the sound effects of the guns by pulling the trigger on my GameCube controller, and in the background, the music wouldn't overlap with the rest of the audio in my movie. Then I'd plug my camera's video cable and my GameCube's audio cable into the VCR and manually trigger the sound effects as they were needed in the scene. I know, that probably didn't make much sense. It's definitely a weird setup, right? But this was before I had a computer that could edit video footage. Heck, it was before I even had a camera that could shoot footage that you could edit on a computer. It was also before YouTube, before I had access to the internet to look up tutorials for other, better ways I could be doing what I was doing. But, crude as my process was, I was just too hungry to create something to care. The games I played made me want to not only enter new worlds, but to create worlds of my own. This experience primed me for a college education and a career doing, more or less, the same type of work to this day. One of the biggest complaints hurled at games is that they're escapist that people who are too burned out or scared of reality retreat into a safe digital world, ignore their problems, and waste time on something that is ultimately fake. And sure, this may be true for some people some of the time. But more often than not, games are not escapist. They're returnist, that you return from the game world enriched with new ideas and with inspiration to take action on them. When I was a kid, I didn't want to just escape to Sonic's world. I wanted to bring a piece of it back with me into reality. This makes games the perfect medium for my generation and the generations to come after. People who are raised with the expectation that media is something to participate in, not just consume as an idle bystander. Games beckon not idleness, but action. Not detachment, but active experimentation. Not ignorance, but mastery. But outside of creativity, games are even more likely to foster something else entirely. Relationships. This is the third and final gift I'll discuss for today. One of my earliest friends is named Maria. She's two years older than me, and my mom regularly babysat her before I was born, and for many years after, making her almost like a half-sister to me. At a young age, being two years apart can make a huge difference, but we always found things to do and games to play, and one of our favorites was Sonic. Now, the early Sonic games on the Genesis weren't able to save your progress when you were done playing, meaning you'd have to start from the very beginning each time you fired the game up. So every time Mario came over to our house, we would set off on the adventure once again, each time trying to get farther than the time before. One day, we finally got through the poisonous waters of chemical plant and the traps and enemies of aquatic ruin, emerging into the fourth zone, the Las Vegas-inspired nightlife wonderland called Casino Night. I remember our eyes lighting up in wonder at the bright colors and the pinball-inspired level design. We'd spend hours making our way through the zones of Sonic 2, humming along at full volume to the game's tunes. As the years went on, I would begin passing my love of Sonic to my younger cousins, as each of them came of age where they could start playing games. Since I'm an only child, this is how I imagine it feels to be an older brother passing down the things they love to younger siblings. It was always a small thrill as I'd hand my cousins the controller for the first time, that they could finally understand, take action, and enter the digital world that they had spent years watching me enjoy. As the years went on, many of my friends would move on from Sonic. Maria did, too, when she discovered another immensely popular game called The Sims. This was finally a game she could introduce to me after years of me sharing games with her. Meanwhile, my cousins would begin to explore their own favorite games, reporting back to me at family gatherings to show me their discoveries. Sharing games with friends and family, especially ones that lived far away, 
became a way to immediately pick up where we left off, erasing any sort of awkwardness or distance created by time spent away. The beauty of video games is that they can have this power no matter what stage of your life they're in. I was able to spark up many friendships in college using games as an icebreaker. No matter who I meet through the years, it doesn't take people long to learn of my love for the Sonic series. And if any of these peers grew up with video games, even just a little, there's a good chance they have similar memories of Sonic, playing, sharing, or even just witnessing the games with friends and family, sparking fond memories of days gone by. But while I've shared games with many a friend and family member, there is one bond that I shared this most deeply, the one that set me down this path in the first place. And that is the one with my dad. I'll never forget the day my dad got me the Sega Genesis in 1994. My parents were in the midst of building their forever home, and in all the busyness that went into building a house, they wanted to get me something special to celebrate. My dad drove me to the store I mentioned in the last episode. Even though we had been to the store's electronics aisle dozens of times, on that special night, my dad pretended not to know where it was and asked me to show him. Happy to oblige, I'm sure I led him there by the hand with the utmost of expedience. But my dad continued to feign ignorance as we walked around. So, what was that one game you liked? He asked. That hedgehog character. What was his you name? You mean Sonic? Is what I probably said, practically foaming at the mouth. I had been dreaming of this day for months, but had no idea that I would finally be in possession of my very own Sega Genesis on this day. My dad loved surprises like this, and I could just imagine his beaming smile while he watched me lose my five-year-old mind. My dad always made an attempt to enjoy games, but he mostly observed me from afar but I'll always remember his affinity for the game Sonic Spinball. The game was very challenging, but since pinball was something familiar to my dad, it made it easier for him to latch onto the controls, and he had way more patience than me required to navigate the game's puzzles. I would watch in awe as he slowly figured out the game's mysteries, and I loved that we each had our own games that we were proficient in. But with each new game console came new complexities that made things less appealing to my dad. But that didn't stop him from appreciating the medium and following along with whatever new console or game franchise I was fixated on next. And this love of games extended into a greater love of technology, like when he brought home our first family computer, and when he invested in yet another computer when I was in high school so I could continue to pursue my burgeoning interest in filmmaking. He continued this trend when I was in college, when he bought me a keyboard I could use to compose music for films. I now have a son of my own. As I gaze into his curious eyes, I'm filled with wonder and awe as he takes in the world one tiny observation at a time. I can't wait for the day where he discovers his own passions that ignite his imagination forevermore. As I reflect on the lessons of parenting for my mom and dad, I started to wonder why my dad indulged my love of games and tech in the first place. He grew up in a tiny, rural, all-Polish town in northern Michigan. An interest in cutting-edge tech was not fostered by his peers, and it wasn't passed down to him by his parents. But my dad took up many crafts in his life. He built beautiful furniture, made stained-glass window creations, and thoughtfully designed improvements and additions to his home. He was a man who valued his tools and the opportunities these tools could afford you if you mastered them. Every time he gifted me a game console, camera, microphone, or keyboard, he was also gifting me with values, like treating my tools with knowledge and respect. He taught me to harness each tool to create something new and meaningful, gifts that could be shared with the people I loved. My dad could have easily been like many parents. He could have viewed my interest in technology, games, and especially a certain blue hedgehog as something to discourage, and instead point me towards the things he was more familiar and comfortable with. 
but my dad never once labeled my interests as foreign and a waste of time. I knew I always had his support each time he handed down a tool I needed to do my best work. More than anything, this is the lesson and the gift that I want to pass down to my son. And I know that, together, he and I will someday play games that will yield the conversations, discoveries, and shared layers of understanding that I need to support him in whatever path he takes. The Curious Gamer was written, produced, and voiced by me, Devin Pulaski. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, as well as watch the show on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe so you'll never miss a new episode when they come out each week. And it really, really helps the show if you could leave a review or share it with a friend who you think would be interested. I especially encourage you to share this with parents, teachers, and other people in your life who could use resources on understanding games to better relate to the young people in their lives. Also, I composed some of the music in this episode, but a lot of it comes from incredible composers that have contributed to various Sonic games, so I'll list all the songs and composers I used in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and no matter what you're doing, whether you're feeling up or down, remember this, you're never too old to enjoy your life and play. Thank you.